Good morning. Hello, good morning and welcome back to CS492F, Futures of the World. More precisely, to the very last student presentation, to the last vision by you participants in this flipped learning um, experimental course. This is the second presentation about topic G. This presentation is about the future of medicine. And I understand this, that this topic <clears throat> will be presented um, by Philip and by Haram. So without further ado, Philip and Haram, can you turn on your camera and um, start by introducing yourself and then start the presentation. Haram. Okay. And... Hello, my name is Kwon Haram, and I and Philip will be presenting today about the future of medicine. Can you all see the slides? Haram, your, your video is having interferences. <clears throat> Um, this is actually a soundproof room, so I don't, I don't have any choice about other light. Fair enough, fair enough. I'm, I'm sorry. And, uh, right. Okay, but yes, then go ahead. But yeah, can you all see the slides? Yes. All right. So yeah, I and Philip are going to be presenting to you about the future of medicine. Um, and I personally is... I'm per I'm personally interested in brain computer interface, and I know that a lot of you may be familiar with it. But for those of you that are not familiar with it, I brought you a definition of what it is. Um, so it's basically a technology that establishes a direct communication pathway between the brain and an external device or computer system. So, um, like to put it um, briefly, it's basically a system that allows uh, your brain and a computer to communicate with each other, whether it be your brain controlling the external device or or external device affecting your brain, right? So I know that this video is why brain-computer interface is so famous. And I know that previous two teams have shared a video about a monkey playing, um, playing a game without moving a controller at the end. And this, this demo video is actually very famous. And this, um, this actually um, opened up BCI to the public. But but this really isn't it, because if you go to the Neuralink website, on the main page, you can see that they've put on their mission. And Neuralink as a team, um, they they had their they fixed their mission as um, to create a generalized brain interface to restore autonomy to those with a med medical needs today and unlock human potential tomorrow. So if you dive into what they wrote down, um, you can see the term to restore autonomy to those with unmet medical needs. And another mission that they presented is that they wanted to unlock human potential tomorrow. So actually, the playing the game part is closer to the latter, which is unlocking human potential. But what came first is to restore aut autonomy to those with unmet medical needs. So I thought what well, this message, um, what 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 these imply is that they put up medical needs first um, in front of unlocking human potential parts. So in fact, BCI is more important in terms of medical needs um, rather than entertainment purposes. Um, so I thought it'd be a good idea to share how BCI um, is used in, medical, in the field of medicine um, as of today and and once I share all, all of those, I'm gonna share a brief um, introduction of what, what the field of PCI is like today and what it's gonna be in the future. Um, so the first part is PCI can be used in stroke rehabilitation. So people that suffer from stroke have difficulties moving their limbs and that really restricts their daily, um, daily lives. And brain computer interface can actually be used in rehabilitation because, um, so just before I go into the video, just a short introduction is that BCI can be used to move a robotic arm using your thought. 
and people with stroke have hard time um, having control over their own arm. So they practice um, arm movement with robotic arm, which uses their thoughts. And as they do so, um, the connection in their brain gets reinforced and reinforced to the point where they finally get to move their own arm um, well again. So I'm just going to show you a video real quick. Every movement we make, can you all hear the sound? Someone's hand or dancing or lifting a weight requires precise communication between our brain and muscles. However, damage to the brain, like a stroke, can disrupt that communication and hamper movement. Is it possible to restore mobility? Different areas of the brain control the movement of different parts of the body. Think about it like a remote control to a garage door. You need the right remote control to open the door. When a part of the brain is damaged by a stroke, Every move drop that mobility. Different areas of the brain control the movement of different parts of the body. Think about it like a remote control to a garage door. You need the right remote control to open the door. When a part of the brain is damaged by a stroke, it shuts down and it can't send signals to where it's supposed to, like a broken remote control. But other parts of the brain still function perfectly. The brain is actually very flexible and different parts can be trained to take on new functions. Could another still healthy part of the brain be trained to move that part of the body? In other words, can we create a new remote control? First, we need to be able to access the signals the brain sends during movement. It's possible to listen to those signals with advanced electrical sensors. When a signal is detected, it can be interpreted by a computer, which can then convert it into a command, such as moving a cursor. Similarly, when the part of the brain that controls hand movement sends a signal, the computer can record that signal and send a command to a device that helps the hand move. This is called brain-computer interface, or BCI. This is exactly what Jefferson researchers are testing in a stroke patient who has limited mobility in his left arm. They've implanted an electrode in the brain that sends signals to a robotic brace fitted around the patient's arm. They found that parts of the brain that were undamaged by the stroke can send signals when the patient is imagining movement in his limb. By imaging the patient's brain when he is thinking about movement, the researchers can create a map of those signals for movement. They can then use BCI to convert those signals to operate the robotic arm. The idea is that those imagined signals for movement will eventually become strong enough so that the healthy parts of the brain can take over movement of that body part. In other words, they can start to build their new remote control. BCI gives us a way to repair communication between the brain and muscles so that movement can be restored. This new study could change stroke patients' lives in the future. So rehabilitation is actually... So rehabilitation... Can, can you all hear my voice, by the way? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so rehabilitation is actually one of the biggest part of the BCI today. And another huge part of BCI is where you control external device um, with the brain signals. And this work is actually classical work, but um, but it's, it's one of the defining moments of BCI. And this is a video about a patient who hasn't been able to move her limbs for quite a long time. And the researchers here um, brought about the system that allows this woman to use a robotic arm using her imagination more precisely than ever. Pause. She reached out with the robotic arm. She thought about the use of her own hand. She picked up that thermos of coffee, brought it close to her, tilted it towards herself, and uh, sipped the coffee from a straw. And that was the first time in nearly 15 years that she had picked up anything and been able to drink from it solely of her own volition. There was... I just wanted to show how it actually works. And this kind of technology really gives hope to people with paralysis because like before this, um, people with paralysis always had to receive help from others. And that's, and that's a huge obstacle in their lives. But although it may be inconvenient at this point, um, the fact that this technology might be available to them in the future, gives so much hope for them that 
they may one day be able to you know go go through their daily livings on their own without the assist from others and this is actually classical work from over 10 years ago in bci so a lot has changed ever since then and one other thing is that it can not only allow people to um, control device using the brain signals, but it can also help the paralyzed people move again. And a short description about this video is that this man had a lower limb paralysis, but with the help of BCI, um, he could send this signal to the spinal cord, uh, to the spinal cord that um, that it that takes part of lower limb movement. And that allows this man to move his lower limb again and eventually um, walk on his own. Tonight, groundbreaking new technology enabling a paralyzed man to walk again for the first time in more than a decade, thanks in part to the power of his own thoughts. Pertian Oskam was in a motorcycle crash in 2011. 12 years ago, I got a accident and had a spinal cord injury, so I'm not able to move my legs anymore. A year ago, scientists in Switzerland placing electronic implants in areas of his brain and spinal cord that control movement. Then, using artificial intelligence, researchers building what they call a digital bridge, establishing a wireless connection between Oscom's brain and spinal cord to stimulate movement, bypassing the injured areas of his body, essentially putting his thoughts into action. I could control my hips. The brain implant picked up what I was doing with my hips. The 40-year-old has been able to stand, walk, and even climb stairs with the help of those implants. And even when the implants are turned off, Oscom can walk with the help of crutches. The researchers saying he developed new nerve connections. We can give back hope to the people with a spinal cord injury, and they will be able to walk again thanks to this digital bridge. It's still early days for this breakthrough. The treatment is not yet widely available to patients, but it provides a bright beacon of hope for the spinal cord injury community. So um, brain computer interfaces basically changing um, parts of the field of medicine um, that seemed impossible, like having the paralyzed move again, move again. And another recent work about brain computer interface has something to do with people who ha haven't been able to express to their thoughts freely, whether it be due to paralysis or voice loss, um, to express their thoughts again. And we have two works, uh, two recent works, and the left one is is a um, is a work about allowing the man to imagine handwriting, um, writing writing a letter, and that is conveyed to the computer system and decodes that signals. And it, it's converted into a letter so that it can be typed in onto the screen. And the one on the right is um, is a system that is um, applied to this lady who had voice loss um, to um, to express her thoughts using well brain computer interface and the vision technology so that she can convey her thoughts to the computer and the computer um, reconstructs um, the voice the voice that she is intending to make. Yeah, by the way, this video doesn't have any sound. So, I mean, you can see that um, this typing is done on the screen. And this is um, not being typed by hands or keyboards, but it's actually being typed by a man 
uh, with brain chip implanted on his head, and he's imagining um, his handwriting, uh, which is being reflected on the screen. And what is profound about this work is that um, the the speed of the the speed of typing has improved significantly to the point where he could actually um, express what he's thinking without um, too much obstacles. And going on to the second video. Us. What we're picking up on are neural activity related directly to the attempts to move her facial muscles, and that's what we're able to decode into speech. Hey, Anne, how's it going? It is good to see you. Giving them the ability to communicate again with their loved ones and caregivers is really what we're looking to do. I was thinking about running to the store. What time will you be home? In about an hour. Do not make me laugh. Um, I personally thought of um, Dr. Stephen Hawking uh, because he's on the wheelchair and he can't um, speak on his own. And so does this lady. But what differs from um, the technology that Dr. Hawking used and the technology here is that um, Dr. Hawking had to use his eye constantly to type type in his words using the, um, using the keyboard on the screen. But instead, the lady here simply imagines um, of herself speaking speaking out loud, and that automatic, automatically converts her intention um, into voice re reconstruction, and it makes it so much easier for the patient themselves to freely express what they want to say. Um, but I want to talk about what really matters in brain computer interface at this point. It's not just about the algorithms that I shared you. So all the videos that I've shared you is they, they find their contribution in the algorithms, um, how they were able to more accurately decode the patient signals. But, and, and it, that's the field where brain-computer interface is focusing at the moment, but it's, it's not enough. Um, and before I get onto this topic, I just wanna talk about some types of PCI. And the first type of PCI is a non-invasive approach. And this is where you use electrodes um, that you attach on the skull um, to get the brain signals from the brain. And the pros is that it's relatively convenient because all you have to do to record your signal is, is to attach electrodes on your head. Um, but a critical um, cons is that the signal quality is very low because the brain signals has to come out from the brain and then has to penetrate through, through the skull and the skin and as it does so, the signal gets con contaminated very easily. So another approach that came up is an invasive approach. And how it differs from non-invasive approach is that it has to um, go through a, some sort of surgical procedure to implant a brain chip on the brain. So because the chip receives the signal straight from the brain, the signal quality is very high. But the cons is also very clear because it requires surgical procedure and not many of you would want to you know, um, go through a surgical incision just to get a chip that records your brain signal. And what I wanted to talk about was that it's not just about the algorithms, but the future of PCI also lies on um, the technology about the sensors because um, the sensor takes a huge part in PCI. And if the sensor is not accurate enough, all the medical um, needs can't be fulfilled um, with BCI. So I'm, I'm introducing some of the sensors and Neuralink is actually um, a company that makes a sensor and, and a way to implant this um, brain chip using a robotic surgery. And this is, this is one of their presentation. So here it is. That's our R1 robot with our patient Alpha, who is lying comfortably on the patient bed. Uh, this is what we call the targeting view. So what you're seeing is this is a picture of our uh, brain proxy. 
And the pink represents the cortical surface that we want to insert our electrodes into, and the black represents the vasculatures that we want to avoid. And what you're seeing is these hash marks with numbers that represents where we intend to put each of our threads. So should we see some insertions? So the technology of brain-computer interface is not just about um, finding out how to decode brain signals or about develop, developing the sensors, but it's also about um, coming up with a way to implant this sensor as well, because it involves robotics um, and the understanding of neuroscience and et cetera. And Neuralink is, in fact, they're not the only one that's working on um, inventing sensors for, for um, acquiring brain signals. There is also a company called um, Blackrock Neurotech, which is actually one of one of the leading um, companies in this field. And yeah, I'm just going to play this video without it, the audio. And they came up with a different sensor. Unlike the brain chip that Neuralink has come up with, they thought it, it'd be more important for a sensor to be flexible because the brain has very um, varying shapes um, across the regions. So they thought this would be a better type of sensor to record brain signals. And another leading company is called Synchron. Um, they are actually the company that um, that got permission from the FDA to have an experiment on humans even before the Neuralink did. And yeah, I'm just gonna start off with start off with the video. Designed to overcome paralysis by creating a digital bypass from brain to assistive device. An investigational device, the stentrode is inserted via a catheter into the jugular vein and maneuvered into the brain without the need for open brain surgery. The sensors are built onto a self-expanding stent that engages into the wall of the vein and which is designed to maintain blood flow. Over time, cells may gradually grow over the sensors and incorporate them into the tissue. The sensors are placed immediately adjacent to the control center in the brain, known as the motor cortex. The patient may be paralyzed, but their motor control center can still be activated simply by thinking. The system is designed to transmit these brain signals out of the brain, out of the vein, and into a unit implanted under the skin in the chest. This unit is programmed to pick up brain signals continuously, and when connected to an external receiver, may send them to a computer. The command center in the brain is now directly connected to software and the patient would attempt to train their brain for direct operating system control by thinking. Direct brain control of a mouse, a keyboard, exoskeletons and even vehicles may become possible. So their idea is that, well, it could be too dangerous for people to open up the skull just to implant a brain chip on a brain. So why don't we come up with a way way to you know implant the sensor through um, some different approach in this case um, they wanted to insert the sensor through the vein um, so that the patient doesn't have to open up his skull which could be very risky so like there are many more companies that are working on making new types of sensors for recording brain signals from the inner side and you can see that a lot of creativity is being asked here because nobody knows how it has to work or it should or it's gonna work so a question that will be crucial to the future of bci in my opinion is that you need to be able to ask this question to people would you be willing would you willingly implant a brain chip or a brain sensor in your brain when the technology becomes advanced enough so my question is are you like if if the brain chip comes up and you have a choice to implant a brain chip after cutting up your skull, would you do it? Well, if the answer is no, the future of PCI would heavily rely on non-invasive approach. And that's also going to lead to um, increasing the importance of advancement in brain signal decoding algorithm side, because non-invasive approach has its um, disadvantages in receiving, in 
and recording a brain signals that has high signal quality. But if you say that you are willing to implant a brain chip, the future of PCI will be dependent on how the sensor is developed in the near future, because that's the very first task um, for um, for people, uh, for, for the companies to overcome. And just one other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, which which is very closely closely related to brain-computer interface, is brain stimulation. So um, this technology in particular is called transcranial direct current stimulation, which is TDCS in short. So basically what this technology is about, it's, it stimulates the brain with electric current. And why, why would you do that is because the research has shown that their possible usage could be memory enhancement, treating negative symptoms of schizophrenia, treating depression, treating addiction, and even more. So like, if you can affect your brain with the electric current to enhance their memory and control their emotion, like, why won't you use that? So the researchers had the same thought. So active research is still in progress, although they're not they're not sure about how um, how well it's gonna work as of right now. But technology that is more certain at this point is called deep brain stimulation. Um, whereas TDCS, the the method of affecting the brain right before um, doesn't require any any surgical procedure. You basically attach a patch that um, that gives out an electric current and your brain receives electric current from that patch. But in this case, you have to insert a very, very long and thin sensor um, into your brain. And I think it's gonna be more visible if you see it through the video. Procedure, we make two small incisions along the top of the head, make dime-sized holes in the skull, and then using our advanced intraoperative imaging, we have an intraoperative CT scanner. We know exactly where we are placing these electrodes. Then we close everything up and we bring you back on a second day to connect a small generator about the size of this. Goes right in the chest, the size of a pacemaker, and we connect those leads up to the brain fully under the skin so that nothing is visible. The goal of DBS is to provide you a constant source of therapy. You're really on the minimal amount of medication and really able to maximize your daily living. And that's really the biggest reason to consider DBS. So why would you insert a huge chopstick-like device in your head? Um, it's because it's particularly for patients with um, Parkinson's disease where they have a hard time managing, well, having control over their hands because they, sh they shiver quite a lot. And it doesn't always shiver. It shivers at a random moment. And it makes it really hard for them to um, do anything um, in their daily living. So, like, so far, what they do is they heavily rely on chemical and medicines. And that is not always necessarily good for them. So instead of relying heavily on chemical um, substances, um, deep brain stimulation can help them um, have control over their hands because what this can do is it, it stimulates some part of the brain that have control over the motor part. And, and this itself um, erases the necessity of the chemical, um, chemical substances, which also improves their life quality quite a lot. But we got to think about some of the issues as PCI um, gets applied in medical in the field of medicine. So the first issue that, that we should be thinking about is safety, because invasive brain computer interface accompanies sur surgical risk, because you have to um, go through a surgical incision, um, which not many people have done so far. And its long-term effects are not known yet, meaning nobody knows what's going to happen if you um, if you keep the brain chip on your brain for 20, 30 years. No one knows that yet. So that has to be ver verified first. And the other issue is fairness. Like This is just an if scenario, but if brain stimulation, which is mainly used in treatment of disorder, 
um, expands its usage to brain enhancement, meaning um, stimulating the brain to improve one's memory or even intellectual level. Fairness issues may arise because this technology won't be affordable to everyone. So people, only people that can afford this technology um, will be able to receive benefits of this technology. And if this becomes true, only those can afford this would have a head start over the others. And that's going to bring up a huge fairness issues. And another thing is policy and legal issues. Um, because brain computer interface is a new technology um, that has um, never been open to the public, um, it requires new policies regarding liabilities in, and rights to brain data. As the first thing that brain computer interface requires is to receive brain signals um, from the brain. And you must also regulate to what extent the brain stimulation should be allowed. And this, this has a lot, lot to do with the fairness issue, but um, let's say that um, brain stimulation can manage emotion, which is partially true up, up to this point. Um, that could also bring up a philosophical question because one's emotion can be one of the factors that defines a um, person's identity. But if you use brain stimulation to change someone's emotion, should that be allowed or like, won't that be changing one's identity? And there are a lot of things to um, think about. And I have discussion um, points about this, um, this brain computer interface, but Philip will be, um, We'll be including all the discussion points from this part at the end of the class. Um, so that's the end of my part, and Philip will um continue with his presentation. Hello. Wait a, wait a second, please. Okay, I'll, I'll share my screen and share sound. Okay. Yeah, do you guys all see my presentation? Yeah, okay, I'll start my presentation. Uh, hello, I'm Philip Liu, and I will talk about the anti-aging, reverse aging, and the desire for immortality. So, the term aging refers to the process of growing older, characterized by the gradual and inevitable physical, uh, psychological, and social change changes that occur over time. It is a universal aspect of life experienced by living organisms. Yeah. So, yeah, as this def definition, uh, aging is regarded something inevitable and it is equal to all life in uh, on 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 earth but recently anti-aging and reverse aging technology are rapidly uh, developing so anti-aging refers to efforts practices or products desire designed to, to slow down or prevent the process associated with aging and reverse aging refers to sorry. Reverse aging refers to anti-aging, but it is uh, slightly more strong, so that it is so effective that it transforms the target, uh, the people or animal, to a younger state. So you can see the uh, some kind of clay tablet on on the right. So that is Epic of Gilgamesh. So it is um, probably the, the earliest known um, epic poem uh, in the history. So in this uh, story, uh, the, the, 
the the protagonist Gilgamesh find a uh, six for immortality, and but uh, maybe he failed at the end. So it is the desire is very like uh desire is something that almost every human who has exists on Earth has desired. And you can see the Qin Shi Huang or in Korean Jin Shi Huang. Uh, he is very famous for seeking who seek seek uh, immortality, and he maybe uh, send some person even to the Jeju Island in Korea to find some kind of elixir to extend his life. So the question is whether it will be truly possible in the future with advanced bio and medicine technology or some some other like mind uploading I, I will introduce so and there's a, a actually existing solution in nature already and that is the immortal jellyfish so the jellyfish jellyfish called teratopsis dorni on the right which is the uh, uh, jellyfish known as the immortal jellyfish. So it has a reverse aging mechanism. So the left one is like uh, the normal jellyfish and there's a life cycle. So it grows from the very small, small thing and bigger than it, uh, it cycles. So it, it, it dies, but the, uh, but the descendants gonna be like uh, reproduced again and grown up again and again in cycle. It's a normal. Uh, it's like all normal creatures on Earth. But on the right, the uh, jellyfish is uh, has a uh, the blue path, which uh, which makes it itself smaller and become younger to grown up again so it is not actually the reproduction but it actually uh, make it itself younger uh, by the process so uh, lots of scientists are like uh, researching this kind of mechanism so maybe it it might be applied to other uh, other animals and also to human uh, eventually At the second conference of the Hydrozone Society, a paper was presented that... Oh, probably you guys not seeing the video, right? Um, okay. Yeah, desktop, okay. that was so revolutionary that members of the audience did not believe it could be true. One attendee, a respected marine biologist, stated the observation from the paper was in fact totally impossible. It was an observation made completely by mistake. In the late 1980s, two laboratory students collected a hydrozoan specimen that they believed to be Turritopsis nutricula a tiny jellyfish less than a centimeter long. The individuals they collected were in their immature adult medusae form, meaning they were not sexually mature yet and unable to release eggs and sperm. They placed the specimens in a tank, hoping to breed them for research purposes, and forgot all about them. When they returned, they expected to find sexually mature adults. Instead, they found fewer adult medusas than when they started, and lots of babies, in the form of newly settled polyps on the bottom of the tank. Had these jellyfish reproduced that quickly? And if they did, what happened to all of the adults? To find out, the researchers started to keep a close watch on the individuals in the tank, and what they found shocked them. The adult medusae were not spawning and reproducing to create new baby polyps. They were themselves reverting back into their juvenile form, completely reversing the aging process. What they had collected was not Turritopsis nutricula, but a different jellyfish, Turritopsis dornii.
Yeah, so there's a uh, reverse aging mechanism already existing uh, in nature. Oh, sorry. At the second conference of the Hydrozoan Society, a paper was. Yeah, and probably humans already have immortal cells uh, in his or her body. Uh, uh, let's watch a video for uh, shortly. Luckily for us, such a thing exists in the form of trillions upon trillions of human lab-grown cells called HeLa. Let's take a step back for a second. Scientists grow human cells in the lab to study how they function, understand how diseases develop, and test new treatments without endangering patients. To make sure that they can repeat these experiments over and over and compare the results with other scientists, they need huge populations of identical cells that can duplicate themselves faithfully for years. But until 1951, all human cell lines that researchers tried to grow had died after a few days. Then a Johns Hopkins scientist named George Guy received a sample of a strange looking tumor, dark purple, shiny, jelly-like. The sample was special. Some of its cells just kept dividing and dividing and dividing. When individual cells died, Generations of copies took their place and thrived. The result was an endless source of identical cells that's still around today, the very first immortal human cell line. Guy labeled it HeLa after the patient with the unusual tumor, Henrietta Lacks. Born on a tobacco farm in Virginia, she lived in Baltimore with her husband and five children. Yeah, so in short, it, it is uh, the cancer cell. So yeah, like cancer is uh, some kind of cell with errors. So um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so with errors, so it, it, uh, it repaired reproduce itself again and again and again so but this hella cell is so special that it, it is endless so maybe there's a um some kind of potential in human body that might be there's it might be a cells that can be reproduced uh endlessly Yeah, so uh, the question is that aging inevitable for humans. So this is the first step to uh, make some kind of medicine or like surgery for um, surgery for like um, the, the anti-aging or reverse aging. So uh, why we are aging? Because there's a normal cell, but we get some kind of stress, damage, or uh, et cetera. And in the end, it becomes senescent cell. So like uh, secretion of most that trigger inflammation, there's a, so it, it is uh, transformed into some kind of weird uh, state. So the Hayflick limit, which is a terminology in biology, uh, delivers that the averaging cell we divide around 50 times before reaching a stage known as senescence. So as the cell divides, but the, there's a limit because that uh, probably many of you know, the telomeres on the end of uh, like this is a DNA. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah. And of the li uh, linear chromosome gets shorter. It's a chromosome. So uh, if, if uh, it reaches... Uh, it it become like uh, shorter and shorter, but in when uh, people become elderly and then it uh, completely is re uh, gone, then cell will not divide uh, again. So it is uh, aging and it is a senescent cell. So cells um, not divided anymore.
five circles in our environment can happen and will is stop anything gram sims cellular altered in a way that leads to senescence. The final response to cellular damage is senescence. This term might be the most unfamiliar to you, so let's take a deeper dive into the causes and consequences of cellular senescence. The concept of senescence was first discovered in the 1960s by two scientists named Leonard Hayflick and Paul Moorhead. Since then, many research teams have become interested in determining the hallmarks of cell senescence, the factors that induce it, and the effect of senescence on other cells and the body as a whole. While there are ongoing research projects to define new markers or causes of senescence, we do know that senescence can be induced by damage to DNA, shortening of telomeres, which are the protective caps at the end of DNA molecules, mitochondrial damage, and something called epigenetic factors, which refers to changes in our chromosomes that affect the way DNA is packaged and genes are expressed. As the interest in defining senescent cells has grown, so has the interest in deciphering why they exist in the first place. The leading hypothesis for why senescent cells exist is that they serve as a preventative measure against cancer. The best option would be for a cell to successfully repair any damage that occurs, but when this isn't possible, and the damage hasn't reached a critical level of inducing apoptosis, a cell will become senescent to try and avoid becoming cancerous. Instead of devolving into unchecked proliferation, it undergoes a permanent arrest of the cell cycle, which could prevent Yeah, so uh, as explained in this video, uh, cells become senescent cells to not to be the cancer cells. So, yeah, but scientists wanted, want to uh, uh, solve the problem of the shortening telomeres that so that uh, they can extend the human uh, human life. But there's a re there's a recent re there are recent researches regarding that one is the discovering small molecule senolytics with deep neural networks. So it it uses deep neural networks to find uh, the compound uh, for the anti aging. So uh, there was a two thousand and three hundred fifty two compounds uh, for the anti aging. And there's a uh, candidates of uh, eight hundred thousand molecules, and they like fit those into the deep neural network networks as um, the data set. Then the the AI yields three results. So this is the maybe this is a uh, compound for anti aging. And then uh, scientists test one of the three uh, compounds uh, to the rats. Then uh, the the result was was successful because the like old rats uh, become like uh, their yeah they they significantly decrease the senescent cell burden and mRNA expression of like senescent associated gen in the kidneys. So it was successful. So this is one of the recent research, and and then how to how to turning back the clock on aging cells. So there's a senescent cells, but we wanted to uh, get it back to the normal cell so that we can live until like 200, 200, 200 years or three hundred years or some old something like that. So let's watch the video. <clears throat> so there are lots of uh, researches recently uh, as everybody wants anti-aging and reverse, reverse aging. So uh, like massive amounts of funds are going into this kind of researches and yeah.
And there's also organs bioprinting. So only with medicine and with compounds, there, there, I think there are some kind of limits because the organs itself are aging. But with the organs bioprinting, we may be like, just swap our like kidneys or like stomach uh, to a new newer one. So or, organs bioprinting is also uh, one of the emerging area of like anti-aging and reverse aging. Yeah, so this is just a 3D rendering of the process, but uh, there is ex actually one successful case that uh, one of the researchers printed an uh, artificial kidney and transplanted it into uh, um, the kid kids. Uh, I probably I deleted the, the, the page, but it was successful. And the artificial kidney functions very well in the kid's uh, body currently. And there's an alternative solution, probably. Uh, my is mind unloading. So must we adhere to the biological body? Maybe uh, lots of scientists and like futurists are saying that probably it is better to unload our mind so that we become a digital human. And it is also the like like the active research area in the yeah active research research area in the BCI and for example the uh, by the Elon Musk or other and others so. The desire to be free from the limits of the It's thought to be the collective abilities of your consciousness and intelligence, the thing that lets you imagine, recognize, and dream. Mind uploading is the hypothetical concept of making a copy of this inner world and transferring it into a computer to run a simulation of your consciousness. But even defining the premise gets really hard, really fast. The possibility of mind uploading is based on three assumptions. Assumption 1. Your mind is in your brain's structure, arrangement and biochemistry. The idea that everything about the mind can be found in the brain is called physicalism and it keeps our discussion within the domain of natural law. Assumption 2. At some point, we will understand the brain well enough and possess the technology to simulate all of its aspects to make a digital mind copy. Assumption 3. Computer software can host your mind, which means the mind is computable. There is no physical property in the brain, including consciousness, that cannot be simulated accurately, even if it requires a lot of code. All of these assumptions have been proposed and challenged by scientists and philosophers, and they remain the subject of passionate debate. With so many fundamental questions still unanswered, it's hard to discuss the topic without annoying someone. Yeah, so probably mind uploading uh, as a as the 
as the presenter in the video set, uh, my end downloading is uh, uh, inv involves very profound questions like the mind body monism or mind body dualism. Uh, are they a separate two entities or like there are they are they just uh, one from the one source? Uh, so, but mind downloading is. Uh, uh, mind downloading is considered a very like logical solution to be the immortality, but because the biological bodies are has so many limitations and they are, uh, it is very hard to maintain and it is very vulner vulnerable uh, to like travel the travel for the interstellar tra travel or something like that. So yeah, mind downloading is uh, suggested by uh, lots of uh, futurists and scientists. And so what is our state uh, as a biological body? Mind downloading is uh, something uh, different from this main topic. So how close are we to immortality? Oh, let's watch the video. Hmm. I think it's the greatest unsolved problem in biology. So how close are we to immortality? Okay, so by definition, immortality means living forever, as in to infinity. Becker for women and sense changed our patient diets and access to healthcare. This may all seem like common sense so far, but it's actually pretty. And it gradually rose, and today life expectancies in the country doing the best is 87 years for Japanese women. And thanks to accelerating medical, technological, and economic progress, experts think that trend will continue. Plus, in our era of global information sharing, it's much high fat Western or American diet. And in all those cases, the animals were healthier and they lived longer. And that was exciting because no one really had a say. So this molecule NMN, not to be confused with M&Ms, is a, what we call a precursor to NAD. We can synthesize it. And when we give mice NMN in their drinking water, their levels of NAD go up about 50%. And that's when we see these remarkable health benefits in those old mice. They can run 50% further and they're resistant to radiation. And if this works, we could potentially have a pill that could mimic those things. We know that they're healthier, but will they live longer? That's what we're trying to find out. Meanwhile, other branches of medical research are tackling specific diseases or symptoms associated with age. And some exciting technologies are on the horizon. There's been four decades you live 10 years longer. And eight decades, you live 20 years longer. What current research indicates is that uh, young children today in, the, in countries with high life expectancy, most of them will probably live past 100. Their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren might live well into their hundreds. Can we be immortal? Yes, so yeah, maybe as the, uh, as the scholar said, maybe our grandchildren or grandchildren going to live uh, more than like 150 years or something like that. But currently, uh, our life expectancy not going to be higher than like 90 ever in average, something like that in just uh, tens of years. So I'll just skip this video, but uh, Ah, no, no. Uh, let's see just the end shortly. Longer careers would be a blessing and a curse. On the positive side, with so many skilled workers staying in the workforce, our economy would be more productive than ever. But on the other hand, if people stayed in their positions for hundreds of years, then there'd be no room for young people to find jobs and move up. This sort of stagnation would become a problem in other areas like social progression. If the same old thinking leaders from the 18th century never died or retired from power, who's to say we'd ever be able to progress past problems like racial segregation? Yeah, so let's assume that we are going to live like 200 years or 300 years, then maybe, yeah, as the video said, there, there will be no room for like younger age persons. Of course, they will going to live longer as well, but like there will be some problem if the like humans uh, 
life going to be ex extended significantly, then maybe, yeah, there are lots of economic or political or social problems going to be emerged. And this is just the last video. And uh, so currently there are people to be, have desire to be resurrected, uh, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's called cry, cryo preserved. And it's, it's simply as a frozen, frozen bodies. When someone's declared legally dead today or clinically dead, what that really means is doctors can't help the person anymore. But they're not truly dead. Almost everything is still alive, which is why we can donate organs. So what we're saying is don't give up on the person. Turn them over to us. We're going to protect the cells and we're going to store the patient at extremely cold temperatures where they can have a chance of being revived in the future with more advanced technology. I think it's kind of like uh, asking someone in 1900, will it be possible to put someone on the moon? Well, a lot of people said, well, no, that's just science fiction. If you think about it, about uh, 50 or 60 years ago, if you had a heart attack, you stopped breathing, people would check your vitals and say, oh, you're dead, that was it, we gave up on you. Today we don't do that, we'll jump on you and do CPR, or defibrillation, and usually resuscitate the person. Yeah, so probably lots of persons have a negative view on this cryopreserved human bodies. Uh, some people blame it for like, it's just just a business and they have no hope for resurrection or like, and some people say, uh, some people say that um, it is it's better than do nothing after death, but that's, talk about in the uh in the discussion so yeah and the first discussion is from the haram so can you lead the discussion maybe okay yeah um professor are we are we having a break or should we just continue because i know that time is getting near to the end right yes so first of all, let's all thank uh, the two presenters, and I'm now going to uh, put Haram back on the. Let's see. Uh, oh, but we have only like ten minutes left, right? Right. So next week, I'm going to give a concluding presentation trying to summarize everything. And then we will have a discussion uh, about all the presentations, uh, including your presentation. How does that sound? Since indeed we're um, advanced in time. Um, so- Yeah, right. that sounds good to me. Yep. So thank you so much. This was a <clears throat> very impressive, uh, and very visionary presentation, two presentations. Um, yeah, if there are any comments from the audience, <laughs> you're welcome to, to make comments now on the suggested discussion points. We do have a few more minutes left, so let's take this opportunity. Yes, as you said, uh, this this is all looks like futuristic, but uh, if you look back like twenty years before, smartphones were uh, also uh, uh, science fiction, but nowadays everybody uh, basically has a smartphone and uses it as a extension of our brain, right? So uh, if I lose my smartphone. 
and the data, then uh, it's going to be <laughs> terrible, honestly, right? <clears throat> because it, it's really an extension of the brain. And <clears throat> it seems like indeed the next step is to connect it more directly to the brain than, uh, right? So, I mean, Steve Jobs has revolutionized the interface with a touch screen. And the next step is to get rid of all the um, uh, touching and physical connection. Right. Any comments on that? Yeah, so probably it's in, in media theories is called extension of body. So yeah, but I think I also think that BCI is the ultimate solution for like connecting digital devices and human brain because it is very effective because it is a direct connection between brain and the uh, uh, devices. So we don't have to type like we are, are using our hands or we don't have to use our like uh, vocal cords or something like that. So yeah, it, uh, I think it is it is surely is the uh, interface of the future, probably in next uh, twenty or thirty years. Yeah. By the way, you uh, you haven't really properly introduced yourself, right? So I just looked up. You you're both PhD students. Is that correct? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you by any chance in uh, in the brain department of KAIST? I'm actually part of computer a uh, school of com computing, but I take part in studying brain computer interface, more particularly in decoding brain signals part. So that's why I was kind of interested in brain computer interface in general because I myself um, work on the algorithm and I also had a chance to make a system that controls the drone um, with the brain signals. Oh, awesome. So I'm, yeah, I'm very deeply interested in this field. I see. And Philip, how about yourself? Uh, I, I I'm I'm doing nothing with the BCI or brain, but I'm I'm like researching uh, art and virtual space in culture technology department. So yeah, but brain BCI is always always interesting, even in the aspects from the art and media theory area, because. A brain is, the, yeah. As as I said, is is a direct direct connection between the, uh, the mind and the physical uh, physical realm. So, it will change, uh, art and media, very much as well. I, I expect. Okay, then yeah, time is up. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks everyone, actually. And uh, yeah, as I said before, on um, <clears throat> Monday, I'm going to wrap, uh, summarize and wrap things up. And then we'll have <clears throat> the chance to discuss uh, everything. And uh, yeah, so have a great weekend and goodbye everyone.